it won't, it won't do me any good to argue that Darwin was a philosophical radical if he was philosophically inept or unthinking. And there is an old tradition in the historiography of the biographizing of Darwin, if that's a word, which makes him out to be different from the other geniuses in the history of science. Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, they're all geniuses, whatever that means. Einstein was just supposed to Pardon me. Darwin was just supposed to be a bumbling naturalist, not particularly smart, patiently, doggedly patient to be sure, who just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And if that characterization is correct, it's no good talking about his philosophical radicalism if he had no philosophical astuteness. Okay, the three riddles of Darwin's life. First riddle, who was naturalist on board HMS Beagle? Obviously it wasn't Darwin, there wouldn't be a riddle. He was there, he was there. But he did not come on board as the official ship's naturalist. And therein lies a very interesting story that was only uh, pieced together about 20 years ago by various historians. The official ship's naturalist of the Beagle was a man named McCormick, who was the physician and, and surgeon on the ship. And that was entirely conventional on naval cruises at the time. The surgeon would also serve as the naturalist. So if Darwin was not the official naturalist, what was he doing on board? And to understand that, we have to probe the most interesting, troublesome, and mercurial personality of the captain of the Beagle, Robert Fitzroy, who was certainly a most fascinating man. He was a wealthy man, an aristocratic man, by naval convention. He was allowed to take at his own expense as supernumerary passengers any other people he could fit on the Beagle. And other people with similar ambitions had done the same thing. The Admiralty would not fund enough scientists from, Darwin, from Fitzroy's point of view. So he decided he would take along extra passengers at his own expense. He took a cart an, uh, uh, an artist, he took a couple other people with scientific skills, but that's not why Darwin went. Darwin was not at that time in any sense a trained scientist. He was a passionate amateur naturalist, but indeed he was not a trained naturalist. So he couldn't have been brought on board merely as the best person. I can say best man. We didn't let women on ships then. That's not sexist. Thought sexist was not allowing women on the ships. That's another issue. Uh, he certainly was not the best man available for, uh, for a supplementary naturalist on board the Beagle. So what was he doing there? And that comes to the second and rather more interesting and complex reasons for Fitzroy's decision. You have to understand something about the naval practice at the time, which in our psychologically more enlightened century seems so problematical. That is, the psychological toll on long voyages was immense, particularly on aristocratic captains, who by social convention could have no contact except to give ship's orders with anyone on board, Fitzroy would dine alone. No one was close to his social rank. No one was fit to eat with him. Unless he brought someone else, he would be alone all the time at sea. And sometimes periods at sea would run for months and months. If he encountered another ship at sea, he could dine with the captain. When he was in port, he could dine with the local aristocracy. But while on the ship, he was absolutely alone. And the psychological toll was great, and that was well understood. In fact, the previous captain of the Beagle had killed himself at sea under similar circumstances. This is a well-recognized issue, and many captains did bring along supernumerary passengers more or less as social companions to combat this extreme danger of the effects of loneliness. And Fitzroy had more particular reasons, and I think quite accurate ones, for being worried. He greatly feared, and I think he was entirely correct, what he perceived as a strain of serious mental illness in his family, which undoubtedly would be so recognized today as, as bipolar manic depression. His uncle, Viscount Castlereagh, whom he resembled so strongly, his maternal uncle, a very enigmatic and interesting man whose exploits go so far as suppressing the Irish Peasant Revolt in 1798, for which many of us might not approve of him, to essentially allowing the United States to get off easy in the War of 1812, which just between you and me we lost. It was Castlereagh who allowed us to have a face-saving treaty at Ghent, whereby we could keep all our territories. Uh, one of Britain's great statesmen, diplomats, he had committed suicide by slitting his throat during one of his periods of manic depression just a few years before. Fitzroy felt that he was very much like Castlereagh, subject to similar fits of depression. So that is why Darwin went. 
as Fitzroy's social companion. He was certainly well qualified by the proper criterion of social class. Darwin's father was a very wealthy and respected physician. His grandfather had been Erasmus Darwin, one of the great intellects and writers and physicians of the Birmingham circle. He certainly qualified. The fact that he knew natural history certainly didn't hurt. I mean, Fitzroy was going to take a social companion anyway, why not get someone also competent in natural history at the same time since he was trying to beef up the Beagle Scientific Medal. All right, interesting story, but why does it have any relevance to this issue? So Darwin sailed as Fitzroy's social companion. That meant he ate every meal with Fitzroy alone. He was Fitzroy's only social contact for five years. Now understand what kind of man Fitzroy was. He was enormously mercurial subject to fits of rage, always possibly going over that edge into a bout of depression, which everyone wished so fervently to prevent. It took someone of Darwin's enormous geniality and understanding. There's no sign the two seem to get along reasonably well. Now what would Darwin, I, I can't help thinking it's the fly in the wall uh, fantasy. What were they talking about? You know, wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall when Franklin and uh, Jefferson discussed liberty or when Lenin and Trotsky discussed revolution? I certainly would have liked to have been a fly on the wall when Darwin and Fitzroy had their, their dinner. So we don't know what they talked about. And what I'm going to tell you now is conjectural, but I think very plausible. Now, what are they talking about? Maybe they agreed about everything, then it wouldn't be a big issue. But they didn't. Fitzroy had two idées fixes, two central notions to his worldview that could not have been more opposite to Darwin's belief. And they were the two great issues that uh, divide people to this day. That is politics and religion. <laughs> In politics, Fitzroy was an ardent Tory, a conservative. Darwin, an equally committed Whig, a liberal in his terms. 19th century terms. They virtually came to blow on the most contentious issue of all, slavery. Fitzroy was a great supporter of the benevolence of slavery. Darwin, in fact, was almost a professional abolitionist. He married into the Wedgwood family, who had been leaders of the British abolitionist movement. Nothing was a stronger belief in his own worldviews. You cannot find more moving passages against the slave trade. Now, the other place where they differed, or at least came to differ later, was religion. We don't know much about Darwin's religious views at that time, but we do know about Fitzroy's. He really had an idée fixe on the subject of religion. He was a very firm supporter of that most distinctively English brand of argument about the consonance of theology and natural history, namely the so-called argument from design, as embodied in William Paley's book. Natural theology is a particularly English form of argument that goes back to Boyle in the 17th century and up through Paley in 1802, and pretty much ends with Darwin and Darwin's generation. Darwin in the arm of Charles Darwin. Si, yes, si, si. Captain Fitzroy. Si, si, si. Me, soy Naturalista. Hey, hueso. Hueso. Bones. Bones. Hueso. Hueso. Yes, yes. Hueso gigante. Gigante. Aquí, here. Aquí, aquí están los huesos. Fitzroy. 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 F